Good evening, I'm an Italian national living in the UK. In the last two weeks, I've been closely following the situation both here and in my home country. Many of the Italians that I know living here, and myself included, were wondering how much of the current measures in the UK have been informed by what was learned in Italy. Brandon, we've all looked at the figures coming out of Italy with, I mean, open mouths in horror certainly earlier on, and our death toll is not that far behind it. What lessons are we learning? What lessons are the government learning? Yeah, and I think one of the things that was really quite striking, and I think probably cut through with a lot of um, people, and sort of some of the images that we saw from Italian hospitals, actually, that if anybody ever needed a reminder of just how serious dealing with this uh, virus is, it was, it was very clear from the, the tragedy we saw, we've, we've seen in those hospitals. So what here. lessons but, have we learned But, from but them? we are, our experts are talking to their colleagues and we are talking to countries around the world. The chief medical officer I know has been, um, and the chief scientific advisor and their teams and uh, the advisory teams are looking at what's been happening around the world. Not just looking at it, but talking to other countries. Actually, again, just one of the things I was talking about earlier today, just this week, we've seen a, a memorandum of understanding signed between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, making sure we're sharing um, um, experiences and ideas. We yes, were talking about how we share data talk, today between about countries. about Italy, we all looked at, at what's been yeah, happening no, what in Italy. And we're, no, but hang on. Countries. And we've been looking, but just responding to Julia's question, our, our death rate is, is approaching that of Italy. We were only about 30 under it uh, yesterday, their highest death toll. Should we have been doing things earlier? Not to be in that well, we, position? We have, we have, at all times, we have taken the medical and scientific advice around what we think is a correct and appropriate for the situation in the UK. There are differences across countries, and actually we've seen in some countries them using different approaches in different regions of the countries as well. So it's not entirely straightforward, and um, I'll let other experts okay. give a view on that, but well, it's not entirely straightforward to do a direct comparison country to country, but we have taken the medical and scientific advice about what is the right thing to do at the right time, and I think this comes back to an extent to the previous question as well, as why we've got to be cautious around looking too far into the future when we still need to make sure that we are following the guidelines today in okay. order to keep that curve Well, this as question flat is, as is, is not necessarily about looking to the future, it's rather no, looking to the yeah. So, Peter, obviously, you're one of the people advising the government. Mm. What, what lessons can we learn from Italy, or have we learned lessons from Italy? Well, I think we've, we've learned an amazing amount, not only from the experience of our colleagues in Italy, but also in China. And right from the beginning of Actually, the Chinese have been incredibly quick to help us by telling us what they've tried, what they've found to be advantageous and disadvantageous. And they've also been very, very quick to publish a lot of data um, on the management. And I, I would absolutely give credit to the Chinese for their, their generosity, actually, with all the information that they've given us. And also, you know, the more we can slow down this, um, this this epidemic, the more we can learn and more trials can be done. At the moment, there are literally hundreds of trials going on of different approaches to treatment, many of which are starting to look quite interesting, quite promising. So coming back to Italy, they tried a drug which blocks the so-called cytokine storm, a drug called tocilizumab, which blocks a thing called interleukin-6, for those who are interested. And this, um, in small uncontrolled trials from Italy looked like it was producing quite amazing effects in some people with advanced disease. So this is now being put to proper trial in a controlled way with, um, with placebos and other, other drugs. And, I, you know, we are learning so much scientifically about how this epidemic is unfolding. And can I just ask you, Peter, I mean, just shamelessly going to mine your experience since, since we've got you. Italy went into lockdown earlier than us. It was one of the countries that did. And I was struck by, at the press conference today, Dominic Raab saying that uh, the lockdown is working. It, it has worked and it is working. It is saving lives. Which sort of begs the question, why didn't, should we have done it earlier and therefore save more lives? Yes, it's very difficult to get the timing right. We knew the measures that would have to be taken. Um, and though every, everyone knew what was going to have to be done. I think the issue was that the advice that we were getting from some elements of the advisory groups were that, that we could only do this for a limited time to get the maximum benefit. We had to wait until the right moment and then um, apply the brakes and, um, and get the best effect that could possibly be delivered. It's a very, very difficult thing where, you know, this is a new type of virus 
And really, we don't know until we try it what's going to be effective. And Darren, from your perspective, what's your view in terms of, you know, have we, have we learned lessons? How's it looking from, from, from where you're sitting? In terms of comparisons from other countries? Um, I mean, I think sometimes it can be a bit too simple to compare uh, one country with another, and we often lack a lot of the context of, you know, how those societies have developed, how they organise their economies. But one pattern that I have noticed, and this is obviously just my own almost anecdotal reading of it, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it does seem like societies where inequality is high are more vulnerable. And you can see that in the United States, which is the only society that's more unequal than the UK. Um, and I think that that occurs for all sorts of reasons. Um, obviously, right now, uh, people like to refer to what's happening in Sweden as an argument for tight uh, loosening restrictions. But in Sweden, they've got high levels of investment in public services. They've got high levels of public trust in government. They've got high levels of personal responsibility because of all those investments over the long term. Whereas the sort of short termism that kind of blights uh, the, the British political class in this country is, is, is really just the chickens coming home, home to roost, unfortunately. And I don't say that glibly or facetiously. I do hope and I, I, that this is a sobering moment for all politicians of all parties, that the way that we organise our society is, is, is fundamentally unstable in many, many ways. And even Bill Gates, who many obviously think is in cahoots with some sort of Jewish race of aliens in China in order to dominate the world with a man-made virus, uh, nonsense like that actually emerges in a society where there is very low trust in institutions, low levels of education, so on and so forth. He said himself, that his foundation and others had brought to the attention of governments the risk of pandemic, the risk of not having vaccines developed, all of the risks he outlined, and he himself even said if we had invested a fraction in that sort of research and that sort of early warning system that we do regularly and maintaining our nuclear arsenal, then we might not find ourselves in the situation that we are currently in. So I think that this is a moment of immense humility for all of us who are deeply invested in the economic and political status quo in this society. I, I can't think of a better argument for looking at it again. Rachel? I think, uh, to go back to, to Julia's question, there are obviously things that we need to learn from Italy's experience and, and certainly at the beginning of all of this. It, it didn't feel like the policies around lockdown, for example, came quickly enough in, in this country. But as well as learning and do you from think, the... Can I just ask, do you think Labour applied enough pressure there? I mean, I'm wondering if there is a sense that Labour went slightly missing in action for the first weeks of the crisis, because obviously all the, the focus was on, or much of the focus was on the, the leadership election. Well, in the end, the government have to make decisions on this. And, and as Brenda said, the I know, but also you have, have a role to, be... to play as well as the opposition. Yes, and, you know, and I think certainly under Keir Starmer's leadership in the, in the last few days, I think that, that Labour's approach has been around uh, supporting the government when they get it right, willing the government to succeed, because it's in all our interests that government does succeed, but asking those, those difficult questions to try and be constructive, because actually it's through questioning and challenge that you get better decision uh, making. But the, the point I wanted to, to, to make, we of course need to learn from the experience of other countries, and we're a little bit behind the experience of other countries, but we are rapidly catching up. We also, though, need to listen, I think, much more to people on the front line, whether those are people who work in the National Health Service or in our social care sector. And what they are saying, and what I hear in Leeds, where I'm an MP, <coughs> and around the country, is we need more testing. We need to be testing people who work on the front line in much higher numbers and ramping that up much quicker. But also, and perhaps I think most importantly, we need to give people on the front line the protective equipment and clothing that they are crying out for. And it is still the case, sadly, and we've seen these two terrible examples in the last couple of days of three nurses in Harrow who were wearing bin liners to protect themselves because there wasn't anything else available and they've now got coronavirus. Mm. And then a gentleman, a, a, a doctor in East London, who wrote to the Prime Minister and said, give us the protective equipment, we don't have enough and we desperately need it. And now he's dead. And so I would just say to the government, the people who understand this best are the people on the front line who are delivering the care to the people who are our friends and our neighbours and our loved ones. 
and we need to ensure that their voices are being heard in this. And when they say we haven't got the protective equipment, it's not to be difficult or to cause problems. And I know you know that, Brandon, but it's because they are trying to do the right things and they deserve the best equipment and the best clothing to keep themselves and the people that they are supporting in hospitals or in social care settings. And they're saying they haven't got that. And I think that more than anything else, that has got to be the number one priority of government at the moment, to ensure that the people who are dedicating their lives and because of their vocation, putting themselves at risk, that we are doing everything within our powers to give them all of the material and all of the equipment and all of the clothing that they need to keep themselves safe. We've got a situation at the moment where okay. I think around 8% of people in the NHS are, are off sick. And we've probably got the same again in social care. If we ramped up the testing, <clears throat> if we gave them the protective clothing, we could ensure more of them are at the front line and sh ensure that when this comes to an end, that we've lost as few lives as possible. I think that's all of our priority, but we need to listen to those frontline workers. Um, Peter, I just want to come to you. I'm going to move on to a different sort of element of this in a moment. But when it comes to testing, and, and we get approached, people comment on testing to us time and time again. Were we too slow? to get off the mark with testing, in your view, as a scientist advising the government? Yes, I'm sorry, the line, the line has been breaking up this, this end. Can you, I'll ask you again. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, can you, can you hear us? Rachel was talking about testing. As a scientist advising the government, in your view, were we too slow getting off the ground with testing? I think nobody would say that we've been able to test enough and been uh, quick, quick enough off the mark. I think it's incredibly important to appreciate the great work that the scientists who've been developing the testing in this country have been doing. They've been working really hard to build up from a fairly low base because the, there hasn't been enough investment in public health over the past 10 years. And um, the public health um, infrastructure has been reorganized repeatedly. Um, but I, I think that we do know now that we can get on with the testing. But it's really important that it's really high quality testing. We know that. Uh, a positive result is positive and a negative is negative. And uh, there's nothing worse than the bad test. So we have to have really good tests. Uh, Peter, thank you. Let me just give you a flavour of some of the, the comments that people are putting, uh, sending into us. So Chris Gamble, was there a big mistake to employ a herd immunity strategy, then change it to mass isolation, losing many days? Neil Watson, is it time for a cross-party committee for COVID-19, making all the decisions and thereby taking politics out of the emergency. Tom Poole, how much of a risk is a second wave pandemic as there was in 1918? Is the government planning for this emergency? Let me just move on to another question from Thomas Kowalski. Clearly, we're all in distress at this very difficult time and people deal with it differently. Recently, a high profile figure traveled with her family to deal with this in her own way. With such strict restrictions on her civil liberties and to us all, what does the panel think the wider impact could be on our mental health? So I think Thomas is referring to the high profile figure from Scotland, obviously the, the chief medical officer there. Um, Ruby, I want to bring you in here. You've been waiting very patiently. The impact on our mental health, this is something that a lot of people are talking about and there's a lot of concern about it. What's your view? Yeah, he's, there, there is a breakup on the line, uh, so I didn't really hear your question. Well, it just in terms of concerns about the impact on people's mental health of the lockdown, of isolation, uh, simply of loneliness. Weirdness. Yeah, but, you know, we're stating the obvious here. You know, people say, oh, we need more of this. We, need, we all know we need more, but there is uh, an emergency going on right now. So rather than saying, should we have done this, you know, um, those of us who have mental health issues, we've been practicing this for years. So it's almost like the world is now joining us. I, I, I do a, sorry to go on about uh, what I do, but I have a an, uh, an online service called frazzlecafe.org. And every day I have, uh, I do twice a day. There's a hundred people each time. And it's a community of people who are just expressing themselves and, and really, Emotionally, we're not equipped for this. And it's not just about being mentally ill. You know, I wish a, I, I have a politician would speak human to human at one point. We haven't been trained emotionally. We don't understand that 
it's human to be sad and it's human to be feel like a failure and it's we've avoided those issues for oh, we get it. somewhere maybe in the government i don't think in the government oh sadly we're getting a bit of a break up on your line there ruby we'll Can try we and help each other i mean I think, let, let, Ruby, we're going to try and fix okay. that and come back to you if that's all right. Very frustratingly, we're, we're, you're kind of cutting in and out. Darren, you're not cutting in and out, so let me come to you. I mean, the, the chance I talked about, we're all in this together. But when it comes to the restriction of civil liberties that Thomas Kowalski is talking about and the effect <clears> on our <throat> mental health, we're not, are we? And obviously, it's much easier for some people to, to, to isolate and, and, and much harder for others, you know, people living in flats, that kind of thing. Yes, I mean, I think most people are going to be experiencing some level of, of, of mental and emotional discomfort relative to what they can tolerate. So while obviously some people are actually dealing materially with more acute circumstances, everyone feels a certain level of strain. Everyone experiences certain levels of stress and anxiety. And it's important to note that that is affecting everyone and not just people who are struggling financially. But... The, the, the impact of isolation compounded with financial strain, uh, insecurity, uh, as well as many households which will be, uh, you'll have children growing up in a, in a household with perhaps an abusive parent, uh, active addiction in the household. Uh, the, the, the impacts there are quite severe. Um, and, and as for just isolation in and of itself, I mean, social interaction and social connection is everything in life yeah. from the moment that we are in the womb we hear the voice of our mother this brings online many of our first kind of cognitive systems as we develop as children we get a sense of our place in the world as well as our personalities are shaped by the quality of the social connections around us and even when we have grown to full adults and we're leading our lives without other people to connect to and physical space and run our thoughts by and get a sense of usefulness and helping others and listening to others and sharing honestly about how we feel, then we become very unwell very quickly. And the problem is that we often don't detect how unwell we've become. Um, we begin to live in our own heads. We begin to buy into uh, the anxieties, the fears, the resentments that, that, that often we can get away with. Uh, and daily life by running out for a jog or going on a long drive or booking a holiday or doing some uh, retail therapy. Yeah. Now, a lot of these things that, that, that we previously kind of defined ourselves by have been removed, so it's immensely challenging in many respects. Right. I also just want to touch quickly Yes, just on quickly, Darren, just because we've got Ruby back and she's desperate to get in. ...about the, the case for... Uh, loosening the lockdown because of all of the impacts that we're going to see on people, including the mental health problems, people who aren't going to get treated for cancer, yeah, but, but, all of these I things. The difference you? between all of the negative impacts of the lockdown, whether they be medical or mental or emotional or financial, is that these things are not unknown quantities. So we know roughly how we okay. can address a lot of those things and at least mitigate them. We can divert resources to them. We can raise awareness to them. We can deploy people in the community to support. Right. COVID-19 an... is an unknown quantity. Okay. We still don't know very basic things about it, except the fact that it seems to have evolved okay. specifically to avoid detection. Okay, and, Darren, and I just... complete I... confusion yeah. and all of the okay. human systems okay. that have been designed in order to keep our society orderly. So, so while I do accept um, and I don't dismiss Darren. completely those arguments for listening to lockdown, particularly for those impacted uh, who might be in some kind of danger, uh, COVID-19, we just don't know enough about okay. it. And we just don't know what sort of genie we're letting out, out of the bottle. All right, Darren, sorry to interrupt. Just see, Ruby, we've got you, Ruby, got you back and you're, you're, you're very keen to, to, to come in now. Yeah, I mean, we all understand that. But again, it's all, pla sorry, but it's a lot of platitudes. What do we do that connects people? And what's, uh, what's just um, in, inspiring is that when you do see people now, they are connecting in a way that they've never connected before because we need each other now. I mean, we're in a mutual trauma. And so it's no good talking about, yeah, you know, of course, we lived in a world where our only identity was what we did for a living. And yes, we were run by social media. So maybe we can learn from what's going on now that, you know, um, 
I had somebody on the line today during one of the Frazzle cafes who said, you know, rather than looking at the news the whole time to see the death toll, because, you know, that pumps up your anxiety too, you know, let's talk about emo emotional contagion, is that you can really think to yourself, what can I do for somebody else today? Maybe call somebody who needs help. Maybe, you know, get in touch. Maybe do the shopping. That'll make you feel better. You know, even if you're depressed, um, which, by the way, there will be a tsunami when this fight and flight phase is over. But let's just concentrate on physical safety now. But I think by being aware of other people, which we haven't been for a long time, uh, th that kindness, as I say, is also infectious. So we should try to create, uh, a, you know, media or, or get somebody. I love that the Queen came on and, you know, calmed us all down, but could there not be a spokesperson? We don't have a voice that doesn't just uh, say, yes, we're in danger, yes, we shouldn't go out. We know that. But somebody who could train us to understand that it's human to be sad, it's human to feel like a failure, uh, you know, just be honest and speak human rather than standing on your soapbox. And I think we can make a connection that might last past past this uh, catastrophe. And Ruby, you're talking about the longer term impact of this once we've got past the fight or flight mode. And you talked about a tsunami of depression, which I sincerely hope not, obviously. But in terms of the longer term impact, what do you think that will be then? The longer term impact is, um, you know, some people are born resilient, it's in the genes, and other people who, uh, you know, are vulnerable, there will be major mental illness. And as I always say, mental isn't something that happens from the neck up. Mental is physical. It'll break down your immune system, which makes you even more vulnerable. But I don't want to stoke fear. I really... Okay. You know, I, I really, I really think people should try to connect to other people. I know they can't do it physically, but we were always too busy in our lives before. Maybe now we have the time to make that phone call and, and reach out and say, maybe we could all get phone numbers of, of five other people and call up and ask how they are. Let, let's make some of these um, okay. possibilities. Uh, Brandon, do you want to talk human, as, as Ruby was <laughs> requesting there? Well, I always try. I don't know if as a politician I may not succeed, but I do try. But I think it's really interesting what the point Ruby just made, because actually one of the things I found is, first of all, I've worked hard to keep a bit of a routine. But I've definitely been talking to friends and had calls from friends, I know my wife has, that I wouldn't normally speak to quite as regularly and some I haven't heard from for a while. I think there is a really important thing here about the, one of the benefits. We, we often, are, and certainly when I was in the Home Office, were talking about the dangers of social media. Actually, technology now can be hugely yeah. helpful with all the various apps there are to have video conferencing to connect with people. It's not the same as body language, but you can see people, talk to people and reach out. Whether you're making the call to connect with a friend or somebody you haven't seen for a while or because you need help or you think they need support, it's a really important time okay. to do that. And I have to say, in my life, I've certainly noticed that. My wife pointed out to me the other day. There's a few friends we were talking to that we probably haven't spoken to for a while and we've made the effort to. And I think and that's a really and important and thing. That too. We, never, we were never trained in listening. <laughs> and I hope social media now develops ways of saying, you know, on Twitter, I don't feel very well. I feel weak today. And everybody will rush to help you rather than having to show, look what I've got, look at my status. I think that drove up a lot of mental strain. So well, look, now we can learn. Well, Ruby, you'll be glad to hear someone called Michelle Simpson has uh, sent in a message saying, totally agree with Ruby. It seems if you've already received treatment for mental health, it's already in your toolbox for coping with isolation and social distancing. Uh, Mookie says the impact on our mental health will be huge. Anyone who has been locked away from human contact for any length of time will fully understand that. Sharon Chapman says, what about the mental health and well-being of people, especially who are in lockdown alone, mm. that live in flats, mm. apartments, when they, why can they not sit in a park? And coming back to Thomas's question, he's talking, uh, Rachel, about the restrictions on civil liberties and the impact of that on our mental health. Mm. Well, I, I think in a way that the term social distancing is an unhelpful one because we need physical distancing and we're doing that right now in this studio. But actually, we don't want to be socially distancing ourselves from people. We want to be keeping up those connections because they are incredibly important uh, to help us all through this. And I totally agree with Ruby that a lot of people's mental health is going to be incredibly badly affected by this. Some people who already struggled with their mental health and other people who may not have known that they struggled with their mental health but certainly are struggling with it right now. But also, I think Ruby's point about 
it has unleashed some really wonderful things in our society as well, hasn't it, all of this? The looking out for our neighbours and our friends, the phoning up our family members and recognising that actually we are not, um, you know, little uh, isolated atoms, but we are part of something bigger and looking out for... For, for others. And I also ag agree with Brandon's point about, you know, having a routine. I I've got two little children at home and so I'm homeschooling as well as uh, everything else. How's that going? Give you... it's great. I mean, I'm brilliant at it. <laughs> Not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it does give you a sort of routine. You know, you've got to get up in the morning, you do PE with Joe, you might do a bit of maths and literacy, and then you let them go and play with the Lego. But there is a little bit, at least, of a, of a routine. And, you know, I'm incredibly lucky. For this lockdown, I am with the people I love. But that's not the same for everybody. That Some people are on their own, and that is incredibly difficult for some of those people. Other people yeah. are with yeah. abusive partners or in an abusive relationships. They are stuck on the 10th floor of a block of flats with two young children. You know, those experiences... It comes back to Darren's point as well. This is not... Not everybody is experiencing this lockdown in the same way as are we. It depends on the circumstances you're in, in terms of your mental health, your physical health, and the surroundings in which you live. And I think that those inequalities the stark inequalities in society are coming home to us. And I, I hope after this we can build a different type of society where we do worry more about our mental health and our social connections, but also that we tackle some of those economic inequalities that mean that some people have got so little and some people have got so much. And, Peter, you're sitting listening patiently there. I mean, is, yeah. this, is the effect on mental health something you factor in when you're coming up with your plans and your, and your, and your advice for the government? Yes, I mean, on the advisory committees, there are mental health experts, and it's hugely valuable to have them there. I mean, I think we should also just flag up that there are quite profound consequences on the mental health of some of the key workers and the yeah. healthcare workers in particular who are taking extremely difficult decisions under very tough circumstances and may have to actually make life and death decisions that they really feel uncomfortable about um, subsequently. Uh, this has been highlighted by colleagues at King's College London talking about moral injury um, in that you have to make a decision which you then you know, go away and think about afterwards and you think, you know, that person could have lived if only I'd made a different decision. And they feel you know, a, a great sense of, of, of loss and of guilt. Mm. And Ruby, you just wanted to add something in there. Sorry, but, but I... I... I completely sympathize with that. And rather than saying, should we have done something earlier, as we should have physically, it would be nice now if somebody could concentrate a little on what what should we do when, when the trauma really kicks in. Um, if somebody could just put their attention on that, because that'll be the second wave or the third wave, that that we will be mentally shaken. And I don't mean people with mental illness. I mean those people on the front line. Can we start thinking of what we can do now?